So let's review grain boundaries. Talking about grain boundaries, you can think of these as having two crystals that are grains and they are you know, lined up next to each other and they can have a different orientation. The interface between these two little microcrystals is the grain boundary. So you can imagine it, if you want to, as having two perfect crystals or one perfect crystal, you cut it open and if they stay lined up when you put them together, they reform as a perfect crystal. However, if you change the orientation, and there's two ways to change that orientation. One way is you split it and you twist them and you put, you put them back together. That gives you a twist grain boundary. And we don't talk a lot about those, or in this class we didn't talk about them at all, but uh, it's not something we talk a lot about. We talk much more about tilt grain boundaries in which you have these halves, you split them, put them at a slight angle to each other, and then you push them back together. And that's what I've drawn here. In that case, the angle of the tilt is how you characterize the nature of the grain boundary. And what you can see here, I, I hope, is that where you have this boundary, the volume that's missing is made up by atoms, of course, uh, attached here. And when they do that, you're essentially creating a series of dislocations. So here is a dislocation. So you've got an extra half plane above and nothing below. And then here is another. And in fact, you know, this is a fairly long wall and it's just made of a series of dislocations that are stacked one on top of the other. Uh, this happens, and, and you can also imagine that as I take and I move these further and further apart, I have to put more dislocations in to make up for the disregistry, which means that these dislocations have to get closer and closer together in order to make up for the missing atoms. At some point, those dislocations are right on top of each other, and they're no longer dislocations, they're just a mess of atoms. And that constitutes a change in the nature of the grain boundary. So when the angle is uh, relatively low, less than between 15 and 20 degrees, uh, we call it a low angle grain boundary. We imagine it as a series of dislocations because it is, and we can talk about it and its elastic properties in terms of dislocations. Um, and we can talk about the energy so this gamma is the interface energy or surface energy between the two. And as we increase the angle, the surface energy or interface energy changes linearly. When we reach the point that we're no longer a low angle grain boundary, but we become a high angle, then the energy pretty much levels off. And that's because a high angle grain boundary, you can think of it you know, almost like you know a car wreck, right? You got a bunch of broken atoms, on, on the surface, you jam them together, you're going to have some holes, some vacancies, some voids. Uh, you get some rebonding across the interface because atoms always want to rebond to reduce the uh, chemical energy or the, the bonding energy, but it's not perfect. Uh, and pretty much everywhere you're sampling from the same degree of brokenness, whether it's you know a mismatch by 30 degrees or a mismatch by 50 degrees, it's still the same degree of brokenness. And that's why the energy stays constant with changing angle. Uh, worth noting that we also have a few situations like this, where we keep changing the angle and all of a sudden you know, the energy drops. And the reason the energy drops is because that constitutes a very special orientation in which we form what's called a twin. So I've drawn here a twin, and you can see there's an angle, angular relationship between that half and that half of the twin. And that angle has to do with being able to slice through the crystal and then change the orientation or uh, mirror it and glue it back together. So if our unit cell, say this rectangle, then at the twin boundary, we have half of a rectangle here and another half of a rectangle here, and this constitutes the twin boundary. Now, the important thing about twins is if you look at it, 
let's say we have atoms on the corners of each of our unit cell, well then at the twin boundary, all the atoms are still sitting at the interface. There's no broken bonds, which means that this boundary has much lower energy than a high angle grain boundary. So as we look at this angle, at some point, we get that perfect registry, they lock in, they form a twin, and the energy drops. So that is what a twin boundary looks like. Uh, I can tell you that the grain boundaries are, are things that are common. Twins are also relatively common. Uh, they become extremely important in some fairly special situations. For example, twins are responsible for uh, the behavior of shape memory metals, shape memory alloys. Uh, they are also uh, important in the plasticity of some odd materials. For example, indium metal. Indium metal uh, is used for interconnects in electronics, uh, and it has a base-centered tetragonal structure. And in the case of that base-centered tetragonal material, the plasticity is not due primarily to dislocations, but actually due to twins that form and unform. You can think of this type of twinning plasticity as having like an accordion of atoms. And it's an accordion of atoms or you know, the, the ridges on a drinking straw, right? You have the ridges on the drinking straw and you can move the joint of that drinking straw. That's because you have uh, those ridges and you can get the same thing in terms of uh, atoms and atomic structures, particularly metals that, that form twins easily, and uh, it's a mode of elasticity, or sorry, plasticity.